Moving on to horticulture, 56% of the food comes from cultivated domestic crops and they use hand tools. So we'll often see this in conjunction with foraging activities or trade, but again, over half of their food comes from what they're growing themselves. One of the things that differentiates horticulture from intensive agriculture is that we see limited surplus production, which means they're basically doing survival agriculture. They're, make, or they're growing what they need to survive. The production is for personal use. Again, very little surplus. It, whatever surplus they do have, they can use for trade. Uh, we do see gender-related tasks. Everybody works with the domesticated crops, but generally the men plant and the women process. <coughs> Property, everybody has use of the lands but they don't own the land. Families are generally allotted different kinds of plots and that's because most horticulturalists practice what's called slash and burn. And slash and burn means you cut down the vegetation, you burn it, rains come and all the nutrients from the brush are, are leached down into the soil and that's how they maintain fertility. A horticulturalist in an ideal situation might only use a plot for a couple years and then they'll let it lie fallow which means they don't work the land at all. They might use things that are growing back, but they don't actively work it. Um, but then they have to move their plots, so they need a lot of land to be able to do that. So horticulture is extensive in that particular um, framework. So we have that extensive land use. And I just explained the shifting fields. Uh, one of the things that horticulturalists also do is something called polycropping. And polycropping simply means they're growing multiple plants in one field. So for example, I do have done field work in Guatemala and when we're walking ar along we might pass a milpa or a field that's got corn in it and it's got beans in it and it might have some kind of melon or a squash in it so there's really none of the land that's being unused and the beans can then use the corn as runners um, corn takes out one nutrient but beans happen to put it back in and vice versa so again a really great strategy it has pretty good sustainability, again, if they have enough land use or land available to use. And like the other two strategies that we've talked about, horticulturalists are also being pressured to uh, change their form of subsistence and being pushed into marginal areas. <coughs> but again, it is pretty good sustainability. We're going to use the Yanomami as an example. Um, the Yanomami live in Amazonia. Um, the key to their survival is that they garden, which is their horticultural part, but they also hunt and they collect. They don't encourage any one plot to outproduce another one. So again, there's that collective kind of mindset. <coughs> Little to no surplus production. In this, there is a division of labor. Men hunt, women gather. Um, everybody can work in the garden plots, though. Um, what's interesting about the Anamami is that 80 to 90 percent of their diet comes from their gardens um, and they grow things like cassava, sweet potatoes, taro, maize, avocados, squash, ca cashews, and papayas. So it's a pretty wide variety, um, but that's a, a large amount of food to be producing out of your garden plots. The uh, Yanomami are sedentary. Most horticulturalists are. Occasionally, every few years, the Yanomami will move, and that's the entire village picks up and moves. That gives local resources time to regenerate, in particular firewood and the things that they need to construct their homes. And uh, also, it moves them away from trash buildup. Sometimes we will see Yanomami groups moving because of warfare. This is a, a warrior society. Um, and because of that, we see kin relationship that's patrilineal polygamous and exogamous. So patriline we have already talked about. Polygamous means multiple spouses. Now specifically the Yanomami are polygynous which is males with multiple females. <coughs> Excuse me. And exogamous means that you have to m marry outside of a s identified group and in the Yanomami case it's outside of their village. The social structure is based on warrior skill. So the more skilled you are, the more wives you can support and the more children you can support. And Yanomami men compete for resources, including women. And oftentimes, uh, a man, when he's ready to get married, will gather other men of his village, their kin relationships, and they will raid another village for wives. So again, a lot of competition. Warrior skills are highly prized. So that is our horticulture. 
Intensive agriculture comes in two different levels. We have peasant level and an industrial level. With peasant level agri intensive agriculture, we're dependent on draft animals. So whether that's some type of cow or a yak or something like that. Uh, we see very large extended families because while they are using draft animals, a lot of the work still has to be done by hand. Um, and we still see polycropping. So you can kind of think of, of peasant intensive agriculture as a in-between form of horticulture and industrial agriculture. And here we've got mass production, uh, monocropping, which means there's only one type of plant per field, uh, very high capital investment, uh, lots of machinery. We see urbanization occur once we get into industrial agriculture where we're actually producing lots of surplus. And it's also with industrialism in general that we see the nuclear family emerge. And again, we're going to come back to that when we talk about marriage, family, and kinship. Now some of the commonalities between peasant intensive agriculture and industrial intensive agriculture are both manipulate the environment. So it could be creating a terrace on a hillside. It could be on the edge of a lake shore piling up a bunch of muck so that you're making a little island that you can grow on. Um, we see a lot of use of fertilizers. Um, peasants, it's generally natural fertilizers. In an industrial setting, it's generally going to be chemical fertilizers. Uh, we're going to see irrigation projects, occupational specialization. So here, we're going to have farmers, and then we're going to have somebody that's a potter. We're going to have somebody that makes clothes. We're going to have somebody that makes tools. So that's what we're talking about with occupational specialization. It's with this type of agriculture that we start to see a public and private dichotomy emerge. And what we're talking about here is that men kind of emerge in control of public space and women in the private space or the home. Uh, private ownership is part of the basics of intensive agriculture. People own the land and all of the resources on it. We see both extensive and intensive land use. So we no longer really see fields lying fallow for any length of time, maybe a year or two, but that's about it. And one of the ways they try to maintain soil fertility is by rotating crops. So I'm from Ohio, one year we might see soybeans, the next year corn, soybeans, corn, and so forth. Um, but they don't let the land lie fallow at all, hence the need for fertilizers. This is not a sustainable type of subsistence strategy. It destroys habitats, it increases erosion, increases water use, it undermines the stability of other little ecosystems, and it's very high consumption rates. So this is the one that most people use today, but again, it's the least sustainable of all of the subsistence strategies. Now, one of the things that's really kind of interesting is Hopefully you've seen how family kind of changes. Uh, kinship ideas start to change depending on the subsistence strategy. We see the degree of mobility and settlement start to change with intensive agriculture. We're going to see permanent residents long term and we're going to start to see larger and larger populations emerge. Uh, the one thing I haven't talked about is religion. We actually see that start to change with subsistence strategies. While there's a lot of variability from type to type, in general with uh, foragers we often see animals becoming quite prominent very close to nature. Um, pastoralists, animals are still prominent but it's very specific domestic animals and for many pastoralists part of their cultural identity comes from their animals. Um, the Nuer actually men take their names from their their cattle. When we get to horticulture we start to see another shift. We might see multiple deities but they're all going to be surrounding like rain, because rain is really important for growing, um, or the plants. Uh, when we get into intensive agriculture, one of the things that starts to happen is we start to see centralized power, and that could be for you know controlling water irrigation and trying to decide who's going to get what food and so forth. But we also start to see a lessening of the number of deities until we get to monotheistic religions like Christianity and Judaism and Islam. So it's really interesting to see how subsistence strategies do condition all of these other social institutions. And we're going to be returning to this periodically throughout the quarter, but that is it for subsistence strategies.